Hello, everyone. So, welcome to uh, the Digital Science Speaker Series. Today, we are very fortunate to have Professor, professor Matthew Cobb, who is a professor of zoology at the University of Manchester. Obviously, his main claim to fame is that he was the keynote speaker at this year's Digital Science Retreat. Uh, but uh, he may feel that other achievements outstrip that. I can't think how. Um, he gave a great talk to us uh, on our kind of evening meal after the retreat uh, involving uh, the sense of smell. And this also included some great demonstrations, some of which worked amazingly well and surprised the hell out of the audience, and some of which we gave him a bit of trouble on. Uh, but it should be a better audience today, I'm given to understand. Uh, <coughs> Matthew, I have to say, is a bit of a Renaissance man. I'm extremely jealous. He's written a number of books, not just about science, but also uh, about uh, history. Uh, a fantastic book on the resistance movement in France, and a lovely book called 11 Days in August, which covers uh, the uh, liberation of Paris in 1944. So some really fantastic and fascinating uh, works outside science. But today, given this audience, uh, the title is uh, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code, which is um, Matthew's newest book. I think there's another one in the works, but this is the newest one in print. Um, so just before we welcome Matthew, uh, we have a few copies of the book up here, uh, which you can buy at the end for the special price of five pounds a copy. All proceeds will go to Shelter from the Storm, which is a local uh, charity. It's a homeless shelter just up the road from here, uh, where our colleague uh, Richard Cox from Digital Science actually has been volunteering very quietly for the last six years. Uh, and uh, he, he's the one wearing the T-shirt, uh, which says Shelter from the Storm uh, uh, on it. So uh, if anybody would like to, to purchase a book, then we might even be able to convince Matthew to sign it for you. Um, so without further ado, uh, Matthew. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about how the genetic code was cracked in the 1960s and the ideas that got us there uh, in the 1950s. And when I talk about genetic code, DNA, then this is probably the kind of thing you think of, a series of A's and T's and C's and G's. And this is, in fact, the reason well, why I'm here, in a way. So this is the genetic code of a mutation that's called DUNTS. And DUNTS was a mutation that was discovered in 1976 when I was an undergraduate uh, interested in behavior uh, in a psychology department in Sheffield. And I read a little snippet in New Scientist saying that these Americans had made a mutation in the fruit fly, Drosophila, which meant that it couldn't learn. Well, you might be surprised that flies can learn. Well, they can and poor old Dunce has a very hard time of learning things. And so I decided, this was quite extraordinary, that we could use this tiny fly to get at the genetics of something as complicated as learning. And that's why I'm here. Now that's set me on the road that 40 years later, I'm now studying the sense of smell in maggots, which might be more or less complicated, I'm not sure. Now at the time, we didn't, when I was interested in it, we had no idea that exactly what this gene consisted of. We just knew there was something there that was producing this effect. So what I'm going to do uh, now is to wind back to try and see, in fact, when this revolution in our understanding of science actually began, when we understood how genes worked. And we can really date that very, very precisely, which is quite rare in the history of science, to actually say it was on a particular day. And that day was the 30th of May, 1953, where really modern biology was born. And if I say to you that this was a, uh, the basis of an article in Nature by Watson and Crick, then you're probably thinking of this article, the Mole Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acids, which appeared in Nature in 1953 and was accompanied by two other articles, uh, one by Morris Wilkins and the other by Rosalind Franklin, which gave the data that Watson and Crick used to come up with a double helix structure of DNA. But the eagle-eyed of you might notice that this says April the 25th, 1953. 
The date that I'm talking about is six weeks later. So it's not actually this paper. This paper is very good, don't get me wrong. It's a very important paper. But it doesn't actually get to the heart of what life is about, of really of what's going on. Indeed, there's nothing at all in it about the function of DNA and what it does. What they were particularly interested in was this, the double helix structure of DNA, so we've got this here, and the, the two strands of DNA, this is what the remarkable insight that Watson and Crick came up with, were are what are called complementary. So you've got four bases, the A, the C, the T, and the G, and the A always binds with T, and the C always binds with G. So if you get one strand, if you know the sequence on one strand, or the cell knows it, it can copy it, and you can get two strands. And this is one of the fundamental features of DNAs that can copy itself. And Watson and Crick came up with this little sentence that uh, undergraduates often try to copy. I tell them not to. Um, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing between the bases we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. So this is very exciting. Except, when you think about it a bit, it's not that exciting. So, yes, chromosomes have to copy themselves, but it's not, an, it's not a unique feature of life. Crystals copy themselves. They grow. Salt crystals just copy themselves. So other molecular structures are able to copy themselves without having any relationship to life at all. So what was important about the, the double helix structure is not simply that it can copy itself, but that it does something much more interesting. And this is the topic of the second paper that Watson and Crick published in 1953, much less often read, or certainly much less often cited. And this comes out in May the 30th, 1953, and it's called The Genetical Implications of the Structure of Deoxyribonucleic Acid. So in this paper, they're not just saying this is what the structure is, this beautiful structure they came up with, but, and so what? What does its, is its consequence for the way that genes work and the way that cells work. And this is the great insight. And this, I, I was just so struck by one sentence in here. And in that single sentence, basically it opens the whole of modern biology. They say towards the end, it therefore seems likely that the precise sequence of the bases is the code which carries the genetical information. And this sentence is almost certainly the work of Francis Crick. What, Watson wasn't terribly keen on even publishing the paper. He and all his colleagues thought it was far too speculative. Crick comes up with this sentence, and nothing like that has been said before. Nobody has ever put those ideas together in one sentence and said, this is what genes are doing. So Crick, just by sitting there and thinking about it, has really opened the modern world that we live in. And everything that's happened in biology and medicine since can be traced back to this single sentence. So the precise sequence of the bases is the code which carries the genetic information. What I'm going to do is to go through each of these key idea, ideas, sequence, code, and information, and show you where they came from. In fact, they all come about at about the same time. There's an amazing uh, coincidence that is taking place a few years before Watson and Crick write this, in which these different ideas are emerging, and then through the particular genius of Francis Crick, they're all congealed into this blinding vision that in fact changes how we do science. So first, the idea of sequence. Where does the, uh, the idea of sequence come from? And why on earth are they studying DNA in the first place? So most of you will have heard of, I'm sure you've all heard of Watson and Crick. How many of you have heard of this man, Oswald Avery? Because without Oswald Avery, Watson and Crick would never have bothered studying DNA in the first place. So Oswald Avery, largely forgotten today, he is the man who actually shows that genes are made of DNA. Here he is, Christmas 1940, at a lab party. I suspect they've just had Secret Santa. He's got a very fine hat, Fred Astaire hat. And Avery was somebody who was interested in, in pneumonia. That's what he studied. In fact, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize about 30 times simply for his work on pneumonia before he did this groundbreaking work in the 1930s and 1940s on what was called transformation. People had noticed this weird thing. There were two forms of pneumonia. There are the pneumonia bacillus. When you grew them on little Petri dishes, sometimes they were rough when you looked at them, and they were quite safe. They wouldn't give you pneumonia. And other times, they were smooth, and they were very, very dangerous 
and could make you very ill. And what people noticed was that if you put two of these kinds of colonies together, then the rough ones could become smooth and the smooth ones could become rough. They could transform themselves and bizarrely, this could happen if you killed one of those colonies and then put it next to the other colony, then something was going across and was transforming the, the uh, colonies from one kind to the other. This was called the transforming principle. And Avery, primarily because he wanted to know about how to cure pneumonia, this is just before antibiotics are developed, of course, so they, they don't really have any way of making, uh, of preventing the disease. Primarily, they want to find ways of uh, identifying it. He discovers that this transforming principle is DNA. Now, this was a bit of a problem because it didn't make any sense. Up until the 1940s, up until Avery's work, if to the extent that people actually thought that genes were made of anything, because this transforming principle was behaving pretty much like a gene, it was in, enabling a whole transformation to take place. If uh, people thought genes were made of anything at all, because there was a lot of argument, maybe they're not, but there isn't a material basis to it. But if there is, then people assumed they were made of proteins. Now, people knew that genes were on chromosomes, but chromosomes are made not only of DNA, but also of proteins that are holding, we now know, are holding them together. But at the time, it was thought that, in fact, proteins were a really interesting thing, because proteins are infinitely variable. They come in all shapes and sizes, just like genes. Genes can do anything. Proteins can do anything. So the protein component of chromosomes was thought to be the key stuff of genes. DNA was boring. We've seen it's just got A, C, T, and G. And with the relatively crude methods they had at the time, it looked like they were present in equal amounts. So it looked like it was just some kind of structural thing. So chromosomes were just this structure made of DNA, boring stuff. And then the interesting bits of protein on the outside, that was the genes. That was the idea. And Avery's work turned that on its head. And because of a lot of kind of intellectual inertia, there was a huge opposition to this within the scientific community. A lot of people did agree with him. But a lot of people also said, no, no, you've got very low levels of of protein in your DNA extracts. This proves that, in fact, you're not really looking at DNA. That's not the transforming principle. It's the small amounts of protein which you can't even detect that are doing the, the job. So Avery's research was very well received by some, but not by others. And here are some people who did think it was a good idea. Uh, Masson Gulland, who's a, a DNA chemist from the UK, um, and uh, André Boivin, who was a French researcher who uh, in the kind of ruins of post-war France. Uh, Avery's paper came out in January 1944, and within a year, Boivin had replicated uh, Avery's work and shown that it worked in another bacterium altogether, E. coli, who could get the same effect. And this young man, Joshua Lederberg, he was 19 in January 1944 when Avery's first paper came out. He was a, he was a, uh, a medical student, and he read this paper, and we can see it in his diary. And he's just blown away by it. By it. And he says, oh, this is so exciting. And he decides to switch entirely career from being a medical student, 19, I'm going to be a biologist, I'm going to be a researcher, I'm going to understand genetics using Avery's ideas. And within 14 years, he'd won a Nobel Prize. So these three people all accepted that Avery was right. And at this meeting that took place in 1947, tragically, Boivin was going to die of cancer within about six months, and Gulland was... Uh, going to die in a uh, train crash in Berwick in the north of England uh, shortly afterwards as well. They were grappling with this problem. Well, how could DNA, which was boring, composed of these four bases, how could it do all this amazing stuff that genes do? How could genes be so different from one another if they're made of DNA? And they came up, well, maybe it's the order of the bases. Maybe even if they are in the same proportions, A, C, T, and G, Maybe they're not going ACTG, ACTG. Maybe there's something else going on. So the idea of sequence was floating around uh, in the air. And this was to prove really, really important, decisive, and helped to inspire Watson and Crick to turn to study DNA. That's why they were interested in it. And what's particularly fascinating is that uh, they weren't, one reason why they're such a fantastic uh, pair who could bounce ideas off, off each other. Watson was pr primarily a natural, natural historian, a very, very brilliant young man. I think he got his PhD at 21, something like that. So when they're doing this work, he's, when they've finally decoded 
the structure of DNA. He's only 25. I mean, infuriating. Um, and Crick was much older. He was uh, eight years older. Uh, sorry, 12 years older. And he had trained as a physicist, but then various things had been going on in the 1940s, which you may have heard about, which kind of distracted him from uh, his uh, PhD, and so he was involved in, in war work. And then eventually, I mean, when he, he still hadn't really, he was still finishing up his PhD when he was doing this work. His PhD was not on DNA at all. But he was trained as a physicist, and like many physicists, after the Second World War, with the, the power and the horror of the atom bomb, he decided that he no longer wanted to study physics and he wanted to use physical methods to study biology. And that view was shared by Morris Wilkins. Morris Wilkins, who's often called the third man of DNA, he won the Nobel Prize along with Watson and Crick. He was very good friends with, uh, with Crick and he had in fact worked on the Manhattan Project. And he was one of the scientists on the Manhattan Project who was profoundly opposed to the use of the bomb uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and he literally fell out of love with physics as a consequence of what was to be done in August 1945. So he leaves America in 1945, uh, appalled at what physics has done, decides he wants to use these techniques to understand biology. And he ends up studying DNA and using X-ray crystallography, which was, and still is, a very cutting-edge method for understanding the structure of molecules, using these techniques. The fourth person who you've undoubtedly heard of is... Rosalind Franklin. And Rosalind Franklin uh, was like Wilkins at King's College on, on the Strand. Watson and Crick were in Cambridge. And she was recruited to the laboratory in, uh, at King's in 1951 to help with the X-ray crystallography because she was a brilliant X-ray crystallographer. She'd been in Paris studying the structure of coal. And she really knew what she was doing, but she didn't quite get why DNA was interesting. She didn't really grasp that this was the stuff of genes and therefore could tell us everything we needed to know about life. And above all, for various complicated reasons, she had a very difficult relationship with Wilkins, which may have been engineered by the, the head of the lab, John Randall. Um, he wasn't very clear about exactly what her position was. She thought she was on an equal footing with Wilkins. Wilkins, who was the deputy head of the lab, uh, thought that she was a postdoc, a researcher who was working for him, which technically she was supposed to be. But Randall had kind of engineered it so that there would be sparks flying, maybe because he, well, I'm not quite sure why he did it. The consequence was disastrous. So they really did not get on. Wilkins was very quiet and didn't like argument. Franklin was somebody who liked a bit of a ding-dong and knew that by clashing of ideas, then really interesting things could happen. So they never got on. It was a, it was a complete disaster. Yeah, she didn't really get, initially, this link between structure and function. Now, I'm not going to go at all go into the, did Watson and Crick steal her data? The answer is no. Did they use her data to make the structure of DNA? Yes, and that's explained very clearly, in fact, in the article. If you read the 19, first 1953 article, they make very clear that they have had sight of her data and of Wilkins. So what's fascinating is reading her, uh, her diaries, her lab books, is that whilst Watson and Crick are basically getting to the end of working out the double helix structure, she's nearly there. She's nearly there on her own at a time when she was so appalled by the dreadful atmosphere at King, she decided to leave and was going to work on RNA in uh, at Birkbeck. She was just kind of finishing up. And in her diary, in her notes in her lab book, you can see that she realizes that this sequence of bases is the genetic code. She realizes, she doesn't quite put it so neatly, but she basically understands that. And that only makes her achievement all the greater, I think, because she was working on her own. Watson and Crick could bat ideas off each other and have crazy ideas and say, no, that's not right, and this. She was entirely on her own because of this dreadful atmosphere at King's. Now, just for the archivists amongst you, this is actually the DNA that they use, so you can't quite see it, probably, but this is a very high-tech piece of uh, equipment. Um, it's a paper clip that they have bent round, and then a very, very thin piece of DNA, which is what they were using to make their X-ray crystallographic images. Um, and because there were various problems with the equipment they were using, all this had to be wrapped up in a condom. It was Wilkins who finally realised they needed to be airtight. So you put this in a condom, you tighten it, and then you put it in, this is the camera, so-called camera they use. These are at the King's College archive. Um, 
and you put the sample across here, and you put a piece of uh, photographic film underneath here, then you bombard it with x-rays for hours and hours and hours, then eventually you get an image which, with a lot of mathematics, you can finally uh, decode. So that's where the idea of sequence and why they were studying uh, DNA came from. But what about the idea of code? Why, where's code come from? It seems very obvious. If you ask anybody what's in, you know, what, what are genes doing? Well, it's the genetic code. There's a code in there. We all understand that. But in fact, this idea, again, comes from the 1940s. It comes from uh, Erwin Schrodinger, who's a physicist. I'm sure you've heard of him because of the dreadful things that he used to do to cats. No cats were hurt. Um, and in 1944, he fled Nazi Germany uh, in 1938, leaving his Nobel Prize medal behind him. Um, and he was given refuge, effectively, in Dublin, and he set up for a new uh, Institute of Advanced Studies. And one of the things he had to do there was to give a talk. And if so, a public talk for the general public to explain his research. And so, being a physicist, he thought, well, yeah, quantum mechanics, that's... That's, I'm not going to talk about that. I'll talk about something easy. Talk about something easy. I'll solve the problem of what is life, because it's just going to be a physical problem. So he did exactly that. Now, it turned out to be a bit more complicated than he thought. It took him three lectures, not just one. So he spent three lectures talking about the nature of life seen from a physicist's point of view. This was eventually published in a book in 1944, and it's still in print, and it has been immensely influential. It's a very, very interesting book. Uh, very worthwhile reading, a physicist's approach to life. And in there, the only things I'm going to talk about today are his ideas about genes. Now, he didn't only come up with this himself, but uh, it was based on the, some of the thinking that was going on uh, in, by biologists at the time. But even so, he condensed and really purified these ideas. And so he says, firstly, that the hereditary material, so what genes are made of, at the time he... He assumed it was a protein because everybody else did, or did, although you'll notice the synchrony. This is exactly the same time as Avery is finishing these experiments. Schrodinger comes up with this idea that the hereditary material is what he called an aperiodic crystal. In other words, a solid structure which has a, a definite form, and yet within it, it's aperiodic. It doesn't repeat itself. So it's not a crystal like a salt crystal, which is just the same thing over and over again. But there's something, he didn't know what it was, that is showing variation inside. It must do because genes are varied. So he was just simply by thinking about it, he came up with the right answer. He then said, and this is the insight, this is the code word, he said a gene must contain what he called a code script, a miniature code, which he said was a highly complicated and specified plan of development and should somehow contain the means to put it into operation. And again, this is remarkably insightful. So he's not, he's not saying a gene is a blueprint, which is often what we very loosely say. Because a gene is many things, but it is not a blueprint. Because it doesn't just say the shape of things. It tells the cell how to do things. It's a specified plan of development. And it also contains the means to put it into operation. So a gene is not even a recipe book. It's a better analogy than a, a blueprint. But if it's a recipe book, it's a recipe book that tells you how to go and milk a cow and turn the milk into butter and how to get eggs and how to make a, a bowl so you can then mix it all together. So it, it doesn't just give a set of instructions, it also has the means for putting itself into operation. So Schrodinger's code is this idea that he just kind of chucks out and it has immense influence. And this is a letter from Crick to, Watson, uh, Crick to Schrodinger in 1953. Uh, when Schrodinger, he says, Schrodinger, Watson and I were once discussing how we came to enter the field of molecular biology. And we discovered that we'd both been influenced by your little book, What is Life? The same was true of Wilkins. That was what he took back with him to London to, having left the Manhattan Project, was a copy of What is Life? Crick goes on, we thought you might be interested in the enclosed reprints, the two articles that appeared in Nature. You will see that it looks as though your term, a periodic crystal, is going to be a very apt one. Now, I never use the term aperiodic crystal with my students because they just go, what? And it freaks them out. They can't cope with it. But Schrodinger was right, and so was Crick. That absolute insight was, was true. OK, so we've got sequence, we've got code, and then information. So again, this seems utterly obvious that a gene contains information. That's the most abstract way we could say 
what was going on, the information you need to be able to put into action all those things that Schrodinger was talking about. But yet again, before a certain point in time, you couldn't use that word. It didn't exist in the way that we have it. So people couldn't think that way because they didn't have a, word, a way of thinking about it. And it all happened at exactly the same time, in the mid-1940s, through the work of these two people, Claude Shannon and Norbert Wiener. You may well have heard of Shannon. Any of you have done any statistics uh, may have heard of Shannon and his index. If you've been on a field course, you've used Shannon's diversity index. I don't think Shannon ever went on a field course in his life. But his way of trying to understand the distribution of objects and how you can study them was initially used for communication. So he was interested in communication theory, and during the Second World War, he was working on encryption. He worked with Alan Turing on this, on setting up the encrypted safe line between London and Washington. And he was also interested in anti-aircraft guns, as was Norbert Wiener. And Wiener, uh, in particular, was interested in how you could predict where an aircraft was going to be. So he, if you wanted to bring down an aircraft to shoot it down, you had to be able to know where it was going to be. So clearly there was some very simple mathematics, and if it carried on in a straight line, you would predict it would be there, and therefore you had to fire in front of it the time it would take the shell to go through the air and then hit your target. But things were more complicated because sometimes the pilot would move in a take evasive action, and therefore the system had to respond to that. And he was very interested in how these man-machine systems, because you'd have a machine piloted by a human, and then machines on the ground that were detecting its position, and you'd be responding to that by guiding your gun. And in fact, what he began to realize was that these feedback systems, it's a kind of feedback system, there's something moving around that system, which you can quantify mathematically, but you can also give a very simple name to, and it's information. So in different ways, they are coming up with this idea of information as being a fundamental feature of electronic, mechanical, and human systems. And after the war, 1948, they both published books. Um, this is still in print, uh, Shannon and Weaver. So some of you may well have read this. It's really, really boring. Uh, it does what it says on the tin, the mathematical theory of communication. And yeah, that's what it is. But on the other hand, if you're into that kind of thing, it's brilliant. This book became a bestseller. And this is cybernetics. So all those cyber words that you use come from Norbert Wiener. He coined it. Cybernetics, cyber means guide. And he's interested in control systems in animal and machine. Control and communication in animal and machine. And it is absolutely brilliantly written. It's so lively. Nobody expected it to become a bestseller, but it becomes a global bestseller, creates the science of cybernetics, which is still here in a rather different way. Um, but basically, it set the scene for the next kind of 20 years of thinking about how animals work, how human robot systems work, and so on. And what uh, the influence of Wiener's book in particular was enormous. So these come out in 1948, and they both talk about information in rather different ways. And this almost instantly, because it's so obvious and such a powerful idea, enters the scientific vocabulary, the scientific mind, and once you've got a word for something, a concept, then you can start thinking about things in a new way. And here's an example of what happened. So this is from 1950. Now, there used to be the BBC in the old days. used to have a magazine, which was called The Listener, because it was when it was radio only. And they would publish talks and transcripts, as well as nice little articles. It went the way of all things in the 1970s. And uh, this was a copy from November 1950. And the Reef Lectures, which are still given on the Radio 4, the Reef Lectures that year were given by J.Z. Young, who was a zoologist from Oxford. And his talks were about the biologist's approach to man. And here we've got a transcript of the first talk that he uh, gave. And uh, what I'm going to show you is the occurrences of the word information which was a word that did not exist in scientific vocabulary. You do not find it in any form before 1945, 46, 47. It's absolutely everywhere. The only way that he can now think about how brains work, about how genes work, is in terms of information. Everything is reduced to this abstract concept of information. And this idea sweeps through science, and that's undoubtedly where the magpie Francis Crick picks it up. He's got his sequence idea, 
He's got his code idea, he's got his information idea, and he can see how these three things all come together in the double helix. And that is life's greatest secrets, that it's the sequence of the bases which forms the code that carries the genetic information. Now, that was pretty good. That would be an, a brilliant end to a story. And as far as Watson and Crick was concerned, were concerned, it was. So they'd done this work, and then they went the separate ways. They never really worked together again. So they worked together for about 15 months or so, shared an office with some other people, and that was about it. But then they got a letter. He, Crick was going to Brooklyn Polytechnic, which is better than it sounds, and uh, Watson was going back to Harvard. And they get a letter. And this letter says, your problem, this genetic code, I read about it in your Nature article. That's very interesting. I've solved it. Now, this letter came from a, phys a physicist. You might not be surprised. So this uh, is George Gamow, who was a cosmologist. Um, and he was also a terrible drinker, womanizer, practical joker, a bit of a handful. And he would write these letters uh, many of which consist in the archives, in which he explains things. They're generally written on strange bits of headed note paper from students' unions or hotels as he travelled around the world. And he basically he wrote this letter to Watson and Crick saying, I've solved your problem by a simple bit of mathematics. And uh, it was this, basically. He said, OK, you've got this double helix thing, and you've got four bases... So we've got one, two, three, four different kinds of bases. Well, a little bit of mathematics tells you that with these four bases, with a particular arrangement, you've got these slops in between them on the molecule, on the DNA molecule, and you've got 20 of them. And 20 is important because there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And by this time, people were convinced that DNA was in some way coding for amino acids in a protein. So DNA, not only, but generally, a gene will make a protein. So you've got 20 different solutions. So there you are, job done. Bit of maths, no problem. Except it was rubbish. It was rubbish, and Crick knew it was rubbish because he knew that DNA genes are not synthesized on DNA. So uh, that proteins are not synthesized on DNA. So no matter how nice this might look, it couldn't be true. There's another molecule called RNA, which they knew was involved. And so Crick knew this was a non-starter. This apparently seductive approach was wrong. But it got him thinking. And it got him thinking, well, maybe we can resolve it. And maybe we can resolve it by thinking. Because that's what Crick was good at. He was rubbish at experiments. Absolutely awful. But he was very good at just thinking things through. And over the, throughout the 1950s, a whole set of codes were proposed, by, many by physicists and mathematicians, Cracking the genetic code, finding what those 20 uh, amino acids, how they could correspond to a genetic code. Every one of them was wrong. Some of them were beautiful, like this, but they were all completely wrong. Because they all assumed, because they're physicists and mathematicians, they all assumed that the code must be logical. Because that's what maths is. It's beautiful and logical. And physics is generally, it's a bit weird, but it's still basically logical and beautiful. Life, on the other hand, biology isn't. I know that, I'm a biologist, but they really didn't get that idea. They assumed they could crack this problem just by thinking about it. And they set up something, a rather jolly wheeze, called the RNA Tie Club. And here we've got Watson, uh, Crick, Watson, Alex Rich is just... Uh, sorry, this is uh, Leslie Orgel, who's not playing the game. He's not wearing his, uh, his DNA, RNA tie. You can see this is the RNA molecule. In fact, well, these things are very precious. Uh, so there are 20 amino acids, so there are 20 chaps, all chaps, who are members of this RNA tie club. Um, and not only did they have a tie, this is Watson, not only did they have a tie, but they have that delightful structure, a tie clip, to hold their tie in. And each tie clip had on it the abbreviation of one of the 20 amino acids, so each had a kind of code name. Uh, this is all very tiresome, um, but it's very, very important, because what they did was to exchange ideas outside of the actual normal structures. So they weren't publishing things in journals. They were writing them up on duplicated onion skin documents that they were send, then sending by airmail to each other and circulating them around their little group saying, I found this idea. I found this idea. What do you think? 
So it was a kind of parallel outside of the, bit like an email list today or some server where you can post things without everybody getting involved and just discuss things. And it had an enormous uh, influence. On the other hand, they never met together, which is just as well. This is Watson to Crick. Gamoff was here for four days, rather exhausting as I do not live on whiskey. And Watson was somebody who certainly liked to party at this time. So if he found Gamoff hard going, I don't know what the rest of us would have done. Now, the main thing that they ended up obsessed with was what Crick himself called the magic number 20. What they were all concerned about was that any solution to this genetic code problem, how genes produce proteins, must have 20 options because there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And this was the great insight they had, but it also turned out to be a terrible trap because it's wrong. But it did, a bit of math shows you why they thought this way. If you've got four letters, A, C, T, and G, four bases, then you can't have one base for one amino acid because you've only got four letters and you've got 20 amino acids, so that's no good. If you have two bases, then you've got 16 possible combinations. So that's not bad, but it's still not good enough. So if you have three bases for each word in the genetic alphabet, which is in fact what happens, then you've got 64 combinations. That's great, because it's much more than 20, but it's then it's a problem. How do you get rid of the other 44? So they then started thinking very hard about, oh, this could go and this could go. For example, they decided that any uh, word that was composed of the same three letters must be, that couldn't count, because the cell wouldn't know what it was doing. So that gets rid of four, so we're now down to 60. Um, and then any palindrome, so ACA, the cell wouldn't know what that was either. So we can get rid of another load. So they came, your theory, whatever it was, had to come up with 20. If your answer was 20 at the end, then it had a good chance of being right. Now, the other thing they were thinking about, Watson Crick in particular was thinking about this time, was, well, what's actually happening when genes work? What's going from place to place? We, end, we start with a gene, and we end up with a protein. How does, what, what's actually happening? What's the correspondence between those two things? A gene's got a particular sequence. A protein's got a particular sequence. And what he ended up talking about was what he called, very sadly, the, the central dogma. Now, it's sad because it's not a dogma. It's a hypothesis based on the knowledge at the time. But he'd already used hypothesis in, elsewhere in his article, and he didn't want to repeat himself, so he called it dogma and got in terrible trouble. And here's what he suggests that we may be able to have, and this is all about the transfer of information. So he's entirely embracing the idea of information, but not information as Shannon and Wiener took, took about, thought about it in mathematical terms, but in this very abstract term. There's information in DNA. It can transfer into RNA, which then transfers that information into a protein. And that's, that's what's actually happening when proteins are synthesized. Information moves. That information isn't physical. It's information. It's a correspondence between different sequences. And that's all genetic information is. It's a sequence of bases. And what he says in the central dogma is that you can go this way, but as far as he knew, this is why he said it, you can never go from a protein, so a protein sequence can't rewrite your DNA. And that's still true. So that's why Lamarckian evolution of giraffes stretching their necks and then producing giraffes with longer necks the next generation doesn't work that way. You can't go from a protein to change the sequence of DNA. There's no known example of that. So... Life involves this flow of energy, matter, and information. That's still a pretty good definition of what life is doing. And information is going in this direction. Things can get a bit more complicated. Retroviruses can go from RNA back into DNA. He predicted that quite amazingly. Um, and ultimately, information is just, in biological terms, this sequence of bases and of amino acids. So he's not interested in maths. He's using a metaphor, which is an important Metaphor, not maths. Okay, so they're having a lot of time thinking about this, and then they're scooped. And they're scooped in the most delightful way possible for a biologist, not by a theoretician, but by two experimentalists. And even better, two nobodies. Two people who nobody had ever heard of. This is uh, Heinrich Matte, and this is Marshall Nirenberg, and they were researchers who were... Uh, very much on the outside. So they had these big meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, 
uh, where all the great and the good would assemble. And in 1961, they asked to go. And the people at Cold Spring Harbor said, who are you? No, it's a bit like being told you can't go into a club, you've got the wrong trainers, don't look right. No, you can't connect. They weren't allowed, they weren't smart enough, which was a bit of a shame because they hadn't told anybody, but they'd actually cracked the genetic code. Now, how did they do this? They did an experiment in somewhere called the National Institute of Arthritis and Metabolic Diseases. Now, arthritis is very important, but you can see that this isn't Harvard, this isn't Cambridge, this isn't Paris, this isn't the pulsing heart of molecular genetics. They're very much on the fringes. And what Nirenberg did was to think about the various con results recently that showed that you could get proteins to work, to be synthesized in a test tube. And this is literally the test tubes that they used. So you get all the various bits, the inside bits of a cell, you chuck them in, and then you can get them, if you're lucky, to produce a protein. So you're getting protein synthesis in a test tube. And he thought, well, okay, why don't we just put in some artificial RNA, an RNA that just consists of one letter, put that in, because RNA is the intermediate between DNA and the protein, put that in and see what we get out, see what amino acid is produced if we shove this stuff in the cell. Now, this is a brilliant idea, but it was also pointless. It had been was pointless because the RNA tie club, and he didn't know anything, but Nuremberg didn't know this, the RNA tie club had decided already, if you remember, I told you, any bit of genetic information composed of the same letters, it's not going to work. The cell wouldn't know what to do with it. So they had actually excluded it for entirely spurious theoretical reasons. It was a stupid experiment. Completely meaningless for those clever people. As it happens, he may well have been on the, uh, in somewhere that wasn't terribly important, but in fact, this place, he happened to be literally down the corridor from one of only two places in, in the world where they were making this unearthly RNA. They were synthesizing it. So he was very lucky. He could literally go to the lab next door and say, can I borrow some of this RNA from your freezer? And they said, okay, here you are. And what he found in April 1961 was that if you put in this U, 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 long piece of RNA just composed of one base, for reasons you don't need to know, the base T in DNA is replaced by U in RNA. If you put in this long U, 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 you got phenylalanine, which is an amino acid. So they proved that probably, well, they showed that probably the three letters U, U, U code for phenylalanine. The first word in the genetic code had been cracked. It's quite remarkable. Two outsiders just doing a very, very simple experiment. They were lucky. They were smart, but above all, they were outsiders. They, they, could, they, they didn't even know the box was there. It wasn't they were thinking out of the box. They, they weren't part of the box. They weren't allowed to know what these clever people were thinking about and the experiment had been deemed useless. So what uh, he has to do, of course, Nuremberg has made this great discovery. He has to do two things. He has to send off a publication. He writes two articles for the PNAS, uh, which he sends off, and then... He has to get married, because he was about to get married. So he gets married, that's significant, you'll see. And then he goes to Moscow. Everybody in the world is going to Moscow. It's the big uh, conference, the biochemical conference, 5,000 people at it. Uh, here's Crick, here's Watson. And he gives a talk. And he gives a talk to ooh, about a quarter of the, people in the, of the number of people in this room. It must be said his talk was really boring. And the title of it was, he didn't say, hey, folks, I've cracked the genetic code. It was only in the last kind of two lines that he actually got to the point and said, look. So he gives this talk to just a handful of people, randomers who happened to be there by mistake or were asleep or whatever, the usual thing that happens at a conference. Except there was one person, a young man called Matt Meselson, who in fact was even younger than uh, Nuremberg, who hears this and rushes off to see Crick and say, look, there's this guy who's actually done it. We've got to, you've got to come and talk to him. Now, the words quickly got round, and most people thought that this was one of Watson's awful practical jokes that he liked, and this was not true at all. But Crick knew better, and here's his copy of the, because Crick was chairing the big plenary session the next day, and what he went, he found Nuremberg and said, right, you're on, I'm putting you on. We can see here, here's the timetable, 15th of August, and you can see here, I've enlarged it, Nuremberg and the arrow going down here, and it goes into the discussion time. It does not go into the coffee break. So he didn't break one of the golden rules. So he puts Nuremberg on, and Nuremberg then gives this talk, and what people say happened is that people were absolutely astonished and amazed, and people were dashing out 
to send a telegram. The younger people won't know what that is. It's like a text, but very complicated. Sending telegrams back to their labs to say, this is what you do. This is how you've got to do it. Nuremberg basks in this great glory. He said it's one of the most greatest days of his life. Uh, it was said it's like being a rock star. People were shaking his hand and really blown over by I'd just like to indicate what a great man Francis Crick was, was just say, hey, okay, you've done it, brilliant, here you are, giving it, putting him onto the stage of history. But Nuremberg then made a mistake. I said he got married. So what do you do when he got married? You have a honeymoon. So he went on his honeymoon for a couple of weeks in Moscow, Finland, have a nice time. He gets back to America at the beginning of September, and he discovers that he's being scooped, that those telegrams and everything have had an effect, and that somebody called Ochoa, who'd already won, no, won Nobel Prize, for goodness sake, a few years earlier, would set his big lab of about 20 postdocs to start churning out the same experiment. They'd replicated his work, they'd extended it to other artificial uh, RNAs, and they were about to just roll him over. And then something very good happened. He got a lot of support from his National Institution of Health uh, colleagues, and they said, OK, well, if you're up for it, then we'll support you, and we'll give you resources. And Nuremberg later said he discovered to his horror that he enjoyed competing. And basically what happened very soon, uh, the problems of this simple solution couldn't carry on. You couldn't resolve all the bases with this simple solution. Very soon it failed. And Oshoa was unable to see a way through. And uh, Nuremberg and other researchers then spent a next five, six years doing some very hardcore biochemistry to crack the rest of the code. I'm not going to go into this at all, um, but it was, it was very hard work, and Ochoa lost that race very decisively, and Nuremberg was one of the winners of it, and by 1967, the last of the 64 combinations there are in those three-letter combinations had been cracked, had been resolved, and the last one, very appropriately, was UAG, which tells the cell to stop. It's basically the end of the message. This is the end of the gene. So this is what the genetic code looks like. We've got 64 combinations, and each set of combinations produces a particular amino acid. This is the first that was coded. UUU in RNA produces phenylalanine. And this is the banner, because they put up, because he won the Nobel Prize the year after, along with two other researchers for the same work. Um, this rather nice banner they put up. Now, this doesn't actually resolve the thing, because if you think about it, it's quite amazing. It's the most brilliant breakthrough in uh, biological history, and all this, none of this was, there was no program grants. There was no big human genome project. It was just done by little groups of people funding this and deciding to do it. There was no overall plan at all. It was done very chaotically with a little bit of competition, but an awful lot of cooperation with Crick as kind of, not the master of ceremonies, but the person who was kind of helping things out. And what this didn't resolve, and we still don't know the answer to, is where did the genetic code come from? Why is it the way it is? Because this is the problem. Crick quite rightly pointed out that the actual code, which I'm going to go into a little bit of detail and then we'll be finished, nobody could have predicted it. So all those physicists and mathematicians who got it wrong, it wasn't their fault. They were trying to do something that was impossible because the genetic code is not logical. It does not have a coherence that you can predict. Frick, Crick called it a frozen accident. It's the way that life has found to do something. You don't want to change it because that would be disastrous in evolutionary terms. You wouldn't work. So we're just stuck with it. And therefore, you could not have predicted the answer. And indeed, 50 years on, people are still arguing about why it is the way it is. The answer, as far as I'm concerned, is that as a biologist, natural selection does things that work. They don't have to be elegant. They often aren't. Most examples of evolution we can see are completely inelegant. There's bad design everywhere. As long as it works and increases fitness, that's all that matters. Francois Jacob, who's one of the people involved at this time, said evolution tinkers. It doesn't design. And that's the big difference between biology and the process of evolution, which includes the evolution of the genetic code, and other processes. There's no coherence to it. As long as it works, that's all that matters. Another way of putting it is biology is messy. Unlike physics, which is beautiful, and maths, which is even more beautiful, biology is horrible and very difficult to understand. Just to give you some idea, because this is the way madness lies. This is, there are conspiracy theories about this, about evolution, about, the, about how, why the genetic code is so weird. Okay, so here we just look at this. This amino acid, leucine, is 
coded by six variants. Six. Why six? Arginine is also coded by six alternatives. There's six different ways of getting an arginine. Nobody could have predicted that. On the other hand, this one, UGG, only codes for one amino acid. AUG not only only codes for one amino acid, but if it's at the beginning of a gene, it says start here. So it doubles up, does two things. Nobody could ever have predicted, there's no rational reason for that. But then it kind of looks like maybe there is something going on. So if you look at the last letter here, the last letter is a U or a C, it's redundant. All these bases, all these sequences, these genes, these codons as they're called, code for the same thing. You don't, it doesn't matter whether you've got a U or C at the end. So there's some kind of logic, and people grasp it. What, 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 what. Then you look here. These are the amino acids that are hydrophobic, that don't like water. They're in this bit. There must be something there. These are the really acidic amino acids. So there's some kind of coherence, but then it fritters away. So it's the kind of thing you have a dream about, and you think, I've got it. No, you wake up. We still don't know what's going on. So to summarize, code and information, these ideas that are just obvious to us, these, this really are analogies or metaphors. And organisms aren't computers or machines. They're very evolved things. And these are simply a way of thinking about what's going on. And in fact, the genetic code isn't a code at all. So the idea we're going to crack the code and there's a coherent, logical link between the two bits is wrong. Because a code is just a series of chemical reactions. It's a fixed way that the cell has for doing what it has to do. There's no code there. Genetic information, that idea that Watson and Crick came up with, particularly Crick, is a metaphor. It's not mathematical. Wiener and Shannon wouldn't have understood it. They haven't turned it into equations. It's just an idea. So the lesson, lessons of all this are that stupid experiments can be vital. When I do them, they're just stupid. But when Nuremberg did it, it was brilliant. And theory is incredibly important, including for biology. But no matter how beautiful the answer, it's the experiment that will determine whether that interpretation is correct or not. And that is the essence of science. Finally, I think the most intriguing thing is that these metaphors, information and all the rest of it, you can see where they've come from. They've all come at the same time as our technology is developing, as computer technology is developing. So now, computer and information control are our highest forms of technology. So that's why we think that brains are computers. They're not. Or that genes work as they contain information. They don't really. So we are, we're using these metaphors. We're taking from modern technology. So the implication then is, what's going to happen next? When we get more technology, we'll be able to think about these same things in new ways. The brain, the gene, there'll be new ways of understanding what they do on the basis of new metaphors and analogies.